Okay, now we begin with, not, not that we ever left, but now we concentrate more on the opposition, on Occupy, which has, whose existence, it's true, is an outgrowth of what happened in Wisconsin and before that what happened in the Middle East and North Africa with the so-called Arab Spring. You know, they find these names not because they like names, but because they like a name to hide a reality. They can sum it up and not go into detail so that we never know what's really going on. There are major revolutions against dictators which are put there to protect Israel and in fact often backed by Israel and by US finances. Three billion a year, for example, went to the man who they said they were against, uh, who was overthrown in Egypt. Okay, so we are confronting Israel in many more ways than we have been aware of. And now we have the Occupy movement we are strengthened against every military, including um, Israel's. Um, our two speakers are going to deal with our, the strike's response to Occupy in two different places, one in London and one in the US, in particular in Philadelphia. But there are other experiences here in the audience, and when we have general discussion. We hope that the others will be uh, telling us more. Sarah, would you begin? Or do you want, Phoebe, do you want to? I'll let you go first. Okay. All right, thank Phoebe you. Phoebe from Philadelphia, Phoebe Jones, Karen. Okay, well, I want to begin with, you know, when, when Occupy happened in each of the cities where we are in the U.S., in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and Oakland, and San Francisco, and the Bay Area, um, it, it threw even the most seasoned organizers of us into a bit of a tizzy. Like, we weren't really quite sure what to do, and some of us sort of jumped in and started to do their own thing. Some of us ignored it entirely, like it wasn't happening, and we were going to carry on with our agenda no matter what. Some people, you know, dropped the issues we've been working on for 40 years in some sort of, like, larger cause. And um, some were ready to kind of use Occupy to push our own agenda, you know, to push our stuff forward and get it out there. And we saw, you know, those mistakes made in a number of places. In Philadelphia, one of the left organizations you know, put up a literature table right in the middle of all the collective, you know, tents, the food tent, the information tent, and then there was the left literature table, and it really turned people off, and it turned us off, and, you know, they got put on the bad list of groups. Um, and then we also saw in Oakland um, group progressive mass-based NGOs formed a, a sort of a an alternative structure that's supposedly part of Occupy but was really separate from Occupy that was kind of going to, you know, show Occupy the way, that, you know, raise their consciousnesses and really show them what to do. And as if any of them had done anything of like what Occupy had, you know, done in a mass way. So, you know, we were really trying to feel our way and, and, and Selma really helped us steer our way through, you know, these pitfalls. and so that we could um, both build the strength of the movement and at the same time build and strengthen our corner of the movement. Um, so what did we do? Um, we started to hold our meetings down there so that instead of having meetings of the DHS and DCFS groups give us back our children, we held them down at Occupy and the U.S. Prostitutes Collective held their meetings down at the Occupies in, in San Francisco. Um, and this brought in, you know, the issues and sectors into Occupy that would not have otherwise, you know, been brought in and helped define who was the 99%. So it was mothers losing, you know, custody of children to child welfare, it was prisoners, family farmers, sex workers, people losing their homes. Um, and, you know, all sort of became part of the, you know, the Occupy movement. Um, we got involved in some of the women's committees that were forming. In Los Angeles, um, we facilitated a women's circle that was held and hosted at Kids Village. 
And in Philadelphia, we participate in the Women Occupants, Occupiers of Occupy Philly. Um, and through those groups, we also started then to have actions and demonstrations and marches um, that on, on the issues we were involved in. And for example, in the Bay Area, on the issue of foreclosures and um, because one of our members has home is in foreclosure and also in defense of an arrest. Um, we brought, you know, some of our slogans became very popular, like criminalization of poverty. We had both banners and posters, and in Philly, a homeless guy said to me, that is the best poster in all of Occupy, and it was very popular in the other places where we, we brought it, um, along with mothers, daughters, sisters, wives fighting for our loved ones' lives. Um, we got publicity, Margaret Prescott from Los Angeles, as you know, also is, um, has a show on KPFK Pacifica Radio and was able to give a lot of coverage, you know, both to Occupy and when she was, you know, from the actual Occupy site. Um, we tried to get practical support from unions and from elected officials um, so that in the times of crisis of arrests and when they tried to evict Occupy, that the elected officials, um, you know, we, we tried to get their help. Um, and we brought people down to Occupy. Danny Glover, um, Kiki came from London and was able to speak about her experiences at Occupy Stock Exchange, which helped, you know, bring an international perspective to the U.S., which can tend to be very U.S.-oriented. Um, and I was going to say we brought Selma to Occupy, but I have to really say the Occupies brought Selma to Occupy because they formed, when Selma was on tour in the uh, U.S. for her book, um, they, the Occupies ordered, organized really large meetings um, of Selma to come and really hung on her every word because they were struggling with a number of issues and um, wanted to hear how Selma answered. They were very concerned with how. How do you organize? And also, how do you deal with some of the old structures and issues that have been kind of preoccupying Occupy? For example, you know, horizontalism was an issue, you know, that, that was uh, in Occupy is really everywhere. You know, which horizontalism, which is, you know, supposedly no leadership, no hierarchy, we're all equal. Um, and, you know, but people at the meetings were really like, well, you know, they also knew it wasn't working. Sarah will speak more about how it opened up, you know, great avenues for agents and police and whatnot. But um, people wanted to know, well, if it's not the, you know, if it's not that, it's, and it's not the vanguard party, then, then what is it? And I don't have time to go into everything that Selma answered to that, but, you know, some of the things we've been talking about, the autonomy of the sectors, putting forward, you know, their voices, the building of a core that Nikki spoke about, that some also raised there. Um, but we, you know, but of also the importance of everybody's voices being heard, and there was a slogan we heard at Occupy, no grievance too small for a collective response, which we heard and we brought out, you know, where, wherever we could. Another big issue was making demands on capitalism versus building alternative structures because people were really into like well let's just ignore capitalism and we'll have our own co-ops and things like that and you know in some places when we raised wages for housework or welfare um, people were saying well that's tying you to the state and we're like you know how is demanding back our money that they have for the military and, and you know and the kinds of things they're putting forward how is that tying us to the state it's bringing power back but people had a lot of problems with the, the, you know, what we call is using the state against the state. But they were really glad to hear, you know, from Selma speaking on that. Gender identity politics, you know, also came up. Um, and in a way that was so hard to understand, it was couched in such academic language. It was painful. And we were all trying to figure out, you know, how, what they were saying. But... I mean, they were kind of saying that somehow that if you changed your identity, you were going to be, uh, you know, getting outside capitalist relations. And, you know, um, and, and some also, you know, replied to that, look, why are you trying to define your gender identity now at a time when our possibilities are all opening up? What does that get you? I'm almost finished. Um, patriarchy um, was another issue that came up that somehow social relations were more important than capitalist relations. And, you know, I think this has come up in a lot of places. And, and 
you know, Selma was, was raising, well, what do you propose? I mean, how do you propose? If we're proposing getting rid of capitalism as a way to deal with the hierarchy and, you know, the hierarchy that is capitalism, what are you putting forward? And it was an issue we dealt with a lot in the 60s. It's not a new issue. And, you know, because when, before when women said, well, you know, it's patriarchy and it's in men's nature to rape or be powerful, well, what are we supposed to do, get rid of men? I mean, you know, it doesn't leave a lot of places to go. So, um, finally, um, you know, which was just mentioned in the other panel, was really how do you spell out who are the 99% and who are the 1%, um, and which we just dealt with. Um, but I just want to end by saying that, you know, these issues, you know, are carrying on and the discussion is carrying on. And study groups have now formed at all of the, you know, in each of our cities and within the Occupy structure to read sex, race, and class and discuss it and carry on with it. Thank you. Um, we, women of color in the global women's strike, Sarah Calloway. Okay, uh, I'm going to say a little bit about our experience at Occupy as women of color in the global women's strike and the global women's strike generally. And we put together some notes, a, f a few of us got together and made notes to kind of, you know, put together our experience. I mean, first of all, you know, as Phoebe has said, the, the Occupy movement, you know, was fantastic. It just kind of burst on the scene and we felt like, oh, we've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> And it, for me, it felt like the 60s. You know, I was a teenager in the 60s, and I remember going to a, uh, like an anti-war march in Washington, D.C., and you just felt like your possibilities were opening up, and you, you, know, you felt rich. It was just wonderful. So um, what Occupy did for us, it, it targeted the filthy rich, you know, the 1%. It put a spotlight on them. It made it clear that, you know, it's just a lie that uh, the U.K. has no money. You know, they're doing massive cuts here. And then you saw these, you know, people getting billions of dollars in, um, and pounds in uh, bonuses. And to the degree that during Occupy, some of those bankers had to give back their bonuses. There was such an outcry, and that had never happened before. Um, it, it did things like, it split the church. Um, there was a fantastic man, Giles Fra Frazier, who was a real power to Occupy. He came out the first day and told the police to get off the, the church steps very nicely, politely, politely not, not baldly like we do, but politely asked the police to get off the steps and allowed Occupy, um, Occupy started by trying to occupy the stock exchange. Uh, uh, we were barred from going there and so people went on to the steps of a big cathedral called St. Paul's, a lavish probably the biggest and richest church in London. So it, it put a spotlight on the church and how much the church had connections with corporations and the city of London and bankers. Um, it uh, Occupy, uh, you know, it, it still is. It's a hub for the movement. It's a place where every grievance can be raised. Um, it's particularly at St. Paul's, it was there 24-7, you know, in your face. Uh, the media would go there and interview people all the time, and also it was a sanctuary for homeless people and others who are vulnerable. Uh, there were also, you know, immigrants and asylum seekers went there for help and to, you know, who were basically had no money. Um, one of the most important things is that uh, Occupy said that the 99% belong together, and, um, you know, for us, we felt it was very much an anti-racist and anti-sexist perspective. Um, we were there from day one, and when the global women's strike, you know, marched into the square with our banner, you know, a whole cheer went up, you know, and it was just a thrill, and uh, people were delighted to be together. Uh, it was very welcoming of women, of people of color, sex workers, people with disabilities, asylum seekers, immigrants, and so on. Um, but obviously, the divisions in society, of course, are in Occupy. There's no getting away from that. And... Um, we have to assume that, you know, agents and provocateurs were there from the very beginning. Um, and um, I just wanted to quickly refer to, uh, there's a lot of research being done on the role of agents in the movement. And there's a, a very good paper about, um, they have got some information from, it's called Cointelpro, which was a, it was um, an FBI operation, and they were uh, crucial. They uh, did surveillance on the Panther, the Black Panther Party, and murder. And murder. 
uh, not only in the U.S. but abroad, and they also were active again in Chicago in 1968 when there was a big um, uh, anti-war um, gathering in Chicago where a number of people were beaten and, and you know, badly injured. And they said these are some of the points. They, they f in those days they found that at least one in six of the protesters in Chicago were in fact agents. So for every six protester, there was an agent operating. And some of, some of the things, some of the um, techniques they used were to create a negative public images, image for target groups, break down internal organization by creating conflicts, by having agents exacerbate racial tensions, create dissension between, between groups by spreading rumors that other groups were stealing money, restrict the ability to organize protest by promoting uh, violence against police during pla during planning and at protests, uh, character assassinations, false arrest, etc., etc. So we have to assume that that was what was happening at Occupy, and um, you know that also the state has a big investment in um, trying to discredit, undermine, and hold back uh, you know a movement like like Occupy, which is so important to us. Okay, I better motor along. Um, First of all, agent, what we found is that agents make proposals and suggestions that undermine the movement. And people who are uncertain about going all the way against the state are putty in their hands. And, for example, one of the things that happened was that from the very beginning, as soon as the camp was set up, there were people saying, oh, we should get rid of the camp. You know, and the whole point of having a camp was so Occupy could be visible right in the center of London, in the heart of the financial district. Uh, other, other, other groups, some working groups, wanted to completely narrow down the, the demands of Occupy. For example, the initial statement is fantastic and it includes a whole set of very important issues and people immediately wanted to scale that back. Or they wanted working groups where they only looked at the corporations but they didn't want to mention occupation, poverty, war, and that was a fight. You know, people definitely made a fight to get those issues in. Uh, there was professionalism, that um, there, was, uh, there was a set of people that thought that, well, only the professionals should, for example, speak to the, 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 the press, to the point where somebody actually came and took our woolly hats off. They said, well, we shouldn't appear looking like we were kind of rough and woolly, woolly-headed. So, you know, so, I know it sounds bizarre, but, you know, that's, that was how basic, you know, and we, you know, for example, we fought for, um, we wanted more people of color to be visible in the press, and they would block that. You know, a, a working group would propose, like, a, pers a woman of color to speak to a, a big news program, and in fact, when it happened, the, uh, the white man was there with the black woman in the background. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, it's just, it's so absurd. But anyway, it, it's and very undermined. It's very serious. Um, there were there was resistance at, at the very beginning. The police were uniformed police would walk around the camp, and even one even was was invited to make an announcement to a general assembly. Uh, we raised that, and other, you know, with other people's support, and uh, some people did. Some people tried to block that and said, "Well, the police should be able to move freely." Um, we found that the um, the General Assembly was was very good. You know, people were very sensible. Even people, a lot of people were new to the movement, but people really wanted to know. They were ready to discuss things. And one of the other signs of, of an agent was that they wanted to bypass the General Assembly or have secret working groups away from the camp. And that, you know, that was something that set off alarm bells. Um, we, together with Nell from Women of Color in Oakland, we did a very good statement uh, against the, the, police, the horrendous police violence that was targeted at Oakland people. And um, uh, one, of, one of my colleagues, Kiki, read it out at a, a general assembly. That people were very enthusiastic. They loved it. It was tweeted. It was put on the website. And then uh, the next day, people were saying, oh, well, you know, it mentioned the Black Panthers. And also, in Oakland, they had a march called Fuck the Police, which we mentioned. And people were saying, oh, no, you shouldn't say that. You know, so... <laughs> Look, I'm laughing, but it was very, you know, it's very serious and very infuriating. Um, that sexism and racism went unchecked to the degree that, 
you know, women were driven away and so were men. And even men in Sheffield, outside London, we found people were much more, there's, there's a lot less money outside London and people were very focused on um, issues like welfare rights, poverty. And, it, you know, we found a very eager audience outside of London. In Sheffield, the men told us that testosterone, that is too many men, was making it difficult for the camp. Okay, I'll, I'll just have one more point. Um, and, and so even men acknowledged that they needed women on the camp, you know, because it was more caring and more helpful to them. Um, I'll just finish off by saying that um, Occupy is, look, Occupy internationally is going strong. Occupy nationally is still going strong. The demands of the movement are, are central to everything we're trying to do, for caring work, for to ending wars, to ending occupation. So what we really want to do is spell out who is in the 99%, because in that way, we'll be much stronger. We have to spell out, we have to know the 99% is not just one, it's a whole set of us. I'll stop there. Thank you.